Okay, uh, welcome to um, this workshop called Improving Cultural Competency and Awareness for Health Professionals. And my name is Matthew Weinberg. I'll do an introduction in a quick sec. Uh, see one people, um, that's including myself and the IT tech person. Um, so this is part of the IHA 22nd Annual Health Literacy Conference, working better together, leveraging the power of health literacy to improve health equity. And so welcome, welcome to this workshop. This workshop uh, will end at 1245, but I will give uh, as try to give at least five minutes, they're saying 10 minutes, but I'm gonna try to give at least five to 10 minutes of time for, for Q&A at the very end before that 1245 uh, time. Okay, and here's a blurb from the IHA Health Literacy uh, information. They've been active in health literacy since 1999 and their initiative is to advance health literacy towards health equity. Um, cultural competency and awareness, what bias do you bring to the table? That's the title. Um, it's actually a uh, title here, Improving Cultural Competency and Awareness for Health Professionals. So I've got kind of uh, the actual title on the, um, uh, the workshop or the agenda is Improving Cultural Competency and Awareness for Health Professionals. But I also add there, what bias do you bring to the table? My name is Matthew Weinberg, um, a little bit, just a really quick background. I have a doctor in public health, master's in public health, I'm uh, and a master's certified health educator. Uh, I'm a retired public health officer. I retired in 2020 and adjunct professor at Arizona State, uh, mostly teaching online. And I am also a consultant, independent consultant, having done a lot with COVID and a bunch of other areas. I did the last two years, I was working with the university doing COVID response as well. Um, what brings me to the table? Um, it's not, we all have bias. So what brings me to the table too, is that I've been doing cultural competency and awareness and training uh, for uh, almost, I would say, in, so indirectly most of my life, but directly um, with the public health service uh, around 2017, I introduced uh, a cultural competency and awareness, cultural awareness training program for the for the public health service, and then I did retire. But um, that those courses uh, and that training program still are in existence with the public health service for public health services. So I'm very passionate about this topic, and I'm very uh, I think this is an incredible important topic for people to know and people to understand. Okay, let me know if you have any questions. I'm going to uh, monitor the chat box as best as I can. Okay, what I'd like everyone to do, if you can, uh, get at, try to get a piece of paper or a writing instrument. If you can't, you can use your, your phones or whatever type of thing uh, you can, but just, just giving that awareness uh, that that's something we're going to have. A, we're going to have one a small group exercise that does. Uh, we're going to write things down and have a writing instrument. Um, we're going to do some breakout sessions if I can. It's a large group, so I'm have to. I'm I'm probably I am going to modify and shorten some of these uh, workshops just because of large size of the group. I sometimes teach uh, this in different uh, time spans, and also I teach uh, with different groups and sometimes uh, you know in person as well. So we just modify this. I've taught this online and in person as well. So. Um, I'd like to ask that people do participate. If you can, feel feel comfortable. Um, I'd like to call on individuals um, to, you know, I, I won't put people on the spot, but I just, you know, ask, uh, you know, if you're okay uh, to respond. So I'm going to, to do, it's a participatory type workshop. So I'm going to ask if you wouldn't mind um, participating. Uh, let me know if that, you know, just let me know if there's any uh, anything that you want to suggest, anything that you say, you know, I'm not feeling comfortable with that, just let me know. And 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 um, the importance of this is basically training, teaching, understanding. Um, and as I mentioned, um, depending on the time, we're going to do some small group, uh, a number of small group exercises. I may have to, I will have to probably, I will have to modify some of those, either shorten the time or either basically turn those small group exercises into maybe maybe a group exercise or maybe just uh, uh, basically, you know, call on individuals or, you know, something to that effect. So before I start, any questions, anything I haven't, uh, anything? Okay. What I'd like everyone to do is in the chat box, um, since we don't have time to go around, but I'd like everyone to do is put 
your name. You can just put your first name, where you're from. And so three things, your first name, you want to put your last, that's okay. Uh, where you're from. And then also uh, what brings you to the table? What brings you to here? Why, why are you here? So, and then um, I'm going to start while people are actually putting that information in the chat box. Um, I'm going to start uh, presenting. So go ahead and please start to do that. Um, um, the, some of the, the objectives, the main objectives of this workshop is to find cultural and linguistic factors of cultural identity, stereotypes, bias, cultural awareness, competency, and cultural humility. And then we're going to describe what is cultural identity and evaluate some of these biases and enhance responsiveness and addressing the multiple multi-dimensional expectation and needs of internal external stakeholders and develop a personal leadership vision state. We're not going to go ahead and do that vision statement. So I'm going to do that something what I'm going to ask in the in this workshop, but I'm going to basically give you information to develop that. So I'm going to give you something that you sort of a take home, what you can do to basically what is your personal vision statement incorporating cultural awareness and linguistic competencies. Um, and that's something that uh, is, is will be a take home. And there's a couple of things I'm going to ask you if you wouldn't mind doing um, after you take this workshop. What's the purpose? To increase cultural awareness and competency by providing the knowledge and skills to better serve individuals from diverse backgrounds during work, school, and any other activity. So I don't know what your backgrounds are. I'm going to kind of have a look in the chat box, kind of look to see right now. Uh, Andy, hi Andy, Iowa, Health Infinity Health, um, Melissa, Arizona, vaccination, Nicole uh, Santa Rosa, interested in cultural competency, work for organizations, okay. Terry, Western North Carolina, community nurse and nurse ed educator, rural Appalachia, uh, incorporating culture into health. I taught a, a, rural, a, rural, uh, Appal a rural, rural health course and incorporated uh, rural Appalachia health. Uh, so that, that's very interesting. Thanks, Terry. And then also Marguerite um, from Ypsilanti, Michigan, educating nursing students. So thank you all for those who have contributed. So that kind of gives me a little idea of some of your backgrounds, and I guess one more, and then I'm going to um, move on. Tiffany, uh, Health Literacy Librarian, University of Maryland, Baltimore, and Region 1, um, and um, always looking to expand cultural competency. Okay, great. And then I've got a couple more. Beatrice, uh, Community Health at Atlantic System, Developed Skills, Amon from Philadelphia, Librarian. Great. Okay, I think that's two librarians. Pursuing Master of MPH, excellent. Interest in health literacy and addressing health misinformation. Excellent. Very, very important topic these days, health misinformation. Very, very important topic these days. Thank you so much for those who've contributed. Um, I really appreciate it. And so that's coming from where our diverse backgrounds is. I mean, people, North Carolina, I'm sure Arizona, Michigan, um, all these, and then backgrounds, nursing background, library backgrounds. So we're coming from many, many different backgrounds. So um, whether it's a work, a school, or other activities, whatever you have, it's, it's you come from different backgrounds. Feel free to put information into the chat box that helps me to basically know how well we're doing so far um, with this workshop. What's culture? Okay, Culture determines how we see the world, our worldview. It's a, it's a way to make, uh, to make meaning of things. We don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. We don't see anyone have any thoughts on that. We don't see things as they are. We see thing, we see them as we are, okay? Um, feel free to put into the chat box. Um, I do, you can, um, I'm just making sure, can, can people self take them off mute or do we have to do that? Um, do we have to take them off mute if they wanna talk? Uh, I can take them off mute. Yeah, I would say let's take people off mute. I mean, I do, um, uh, just ask that uh, we don't we, we we have a short of short time span, <clears throat> but if you have a question, feel free to ask a question um, or put it in the chat box. Okay. Okay, great. And other other individuals are putting information in the chat box, which I'll kind of read as I go through. Okay. Culture, the integrated pattern of thought communications, its beliefs, it includes values, um, wholly partially racial, uh, wholly or partially with racial, ethnic, or linguistic groups. So not just racial, ethnic, but, but our languages, what we speak, or even our dialects, as well as our religious and spiritual and 
and biological, geographical, and sociological characteristics. So it's a lot of stuff. And that comes from the Office of Minority Health, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. That is their uh, current definition. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and do this. Um, uh, I'm going to break people up into groups, and I'm going to give you a very very short time span. It's going to be just a couple minutes, but I want uh, I want um, to ask you. I'm going to break them up into uh, we're going to break up into five groups. It's going to be a big you know big but five groups. Um, and what role what role does culture play in your work or school? There are um, there are 19 people in the wait wait room. Do you want me to 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 put them through or? Uh, let me go ahead and take a look at that right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll wait until you do that, and then I'm going to put people into the into into the breakouts. So basically, the so the rules of the breakout is just 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 ask individuals uh, what role does culture play in your work in school. I'm going to break it up into five groups. I'm going to see how this works. Um, and, um, you know, the next, if we do another small, which I'd like to another small group discussion, I may expand it into a large group. So about right now, it should be about um, around a little eight, nine, nine people per, per group. So it's, a, it's fairly large, but um, individuals will basically be able to answer that question. And then I'll just ask each question to, um, I'll ask each group to, to provide a response. Um, and then there's a uh, Amanda Schwartz enter the waiting room. Do you, are you going to admit that person? Or do you want me to admit that person? Okay, good. Okay, so I'm going to now break you up into groups. Um, let's see, 37. Yeah, yeah, five, five, eight. About eight people, eight people per group. I'm going to break you up into groups. Okay, so breakout rooms. We're going to create. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create six to make it a little smaller. I'm going to sm assign automatically. So the question is, what role does culture play in your work, school, or wherever you are? Your where you are. What role does culture play using the definitions I provided? Okay, I'm going to open up the rooms and I'm going to give you a very short time span. So um, please, um, please respond.
Okay. I'm going to, I know I just made a mistake and I apologize. I pressed the wrong button for um, pushing you back in the group. So hopefully all the groups are back. Um, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Thumbs yes. up? Okay, yep. awesome, awesome. Okay, great. Okay, so group room one or group one, what, uh, even if it's a sentence, what role does culture play in your work? Just, just maybe just a summary for room one. Um, you make a difference between um, engaging certain communities. One, one trick isn't going to work for all. Good. Okay. Um, great. Anything else on room one? Okay. I'm going to go to room two or group two. What role does culture play in your work? Those who are in group two, just, uh, you know, someone to respond yeah, so for group two, we talked about how culture um, has an influence on the values that informs activities that people do and also how people approach those activities. And it also impacts how you deal with people and talk to people and communicate with people in a workplace or a school setting or just in life in general. Yeah, very good, very good. Thank you, Nicole. That was Nicole, I think. Um, and then uh, I'm gonna move to a group and feel free if someone else from room one or group, from, I'm gonna call it group from group, uh, two has anything else, but I'm going to move to group three. Group three, what role does culture play? So, <clears throat> not dissimilar. I think we said culture um, frames how we perceive healthcare. Um, also, how well we embrace healthcare, whether we look at healthcare in a positive or a negative way. And again, how well we embrace uh, the recommendations um, that healthcare providers give us. Okay. Yeah. I like that word embrace, how we embrace it. Um, I like that use of that word. Thank you. Uh, and group four, what role does culture play in your work, school, or your life? Anyone for group four? Okay. I'm going to feel free for group four to come back. I'm going to go to group five, group five. We just talked about the impact that cross-cultural awareness and competency has on education and understanding. Okay, great. And when you say cross-cultural, anything specific on cross-cultural that you discussed? Nothing specific, but I guess you could see it most a lot of the time in elderly populations, what they are aware of, um, what they haven't been educated on. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to group six and feel like I said, you know, group five, if you have anything to add, um, feel free. Okay, group six. You know, we, we talked about um, how information can be provided outwardly and how that culture can play a, a big impact. Again, going back to that communication and, and receiving the information and the best ways that they access information as well. Access information. Yeah, I like that. Um, so all of you have said um, words or phrases that I think um, it's, it's amazing how many things we can speak of, and these words embrace. Uh, you know, other types of words that we use. Um, how we can actual, you know, operationalize. Um, you know, our understanding things like that too. So thank you. I appreciate that. And then um, that was group six, correct? Correct. Correct. And so we're going to see if group four has anything to say. And if not, that's okay. So group four, group four connect. Okay, great. Hi, Robin. Uh, group four connecting with populations, understanding communities and building relationships. Thank you so much. And yes, um, feel free to put something in this chat box. And I really appreciate it. I'm just going to go back to a couple other people um, who uh, provided, uh, you know, who they are um, and their background. Gina from University of Maryland. Um, I used to live in, in, in Maryland myself, a clinical nurse specialist working to improve health literacy and cultural competence. Excellent. Dr. Erica Merced. Great. Yep. Um, very close to where I live. A head start interest in gaining knowledge to better serve diverse population, how to address health literacy and UC fam and our, our families. Yeah, there's incredible diversity in the Central Valley of California. Amazing diversity. So thank you very much. And I appreciate that. 
Okay, so we're going to move on to um, cultural awareness. Um, sorry, my. I'm going to click off. Yeah, so sometimes things just pop up on your screen. I have to click out of them. Cultural awareness is a process. It's a process of conducting a self-examination of our own biases towards culture. So we'll, that process of looking at ourselves in depth exploration. This exercise, what I'm going to do, relates to this, relates to that process and it's self-exam. So we're going to do, if you all have a piece of, a piece of paper, a writing instrument, or use your uh, computers, your mobile phones, whatever you want to do, but something you can actually write down, that would be fantastic. Um, because we're going to do a little self-examination exercise. We look into one's own biases towards other cultures and in-depth exploration of, of a cultural and professional background. So that's the cultural awareness definition. And um, we're going to get to that very quickly. But before we do that, uh, just making sure that people know that a cultural identity, how we identify ourselves, which kind of relates to culture, is a combination of multiple interlocking social identities. It's complex. And remember this our cultural identity can change over time. Obviously with age, it's changing, but also with who, what we identify as, gender identity or geography, our uh, spirituality, beliefs, environment, um, we, our education uh, expands. So some things may sort of remain sort of somewhat the same, but things can also uh, change over time. So here's our exercise. Um, on a piece of paper, and if you have one, please write your name in big letters in the middle. So put your put your name in the big whatever that name you want to put. Just put it in, and we're not going to. I'm not going to see. I I won't know what you have. So it's just it's just for you uh, um, uh, on your desk or wherever you are. Um, just to write your name now around your name, write around that that your name. The, who, who am I? So what you remember that. Um, that uh, chart, that uh, picture I just showed you um, uh, just before. Who am I? What do I identify as? Uh, my gender identity, my geography, my ethnicity, race, um, education, age. Uh, you know, if you're multicultural, what are those? Religion, uh, spirituality, non-religion. Um, what, you know, what do you identify as? Um, and it's multiple. So put right. So, so please write as many as you can to what you identify as. And we're going to share with the groups. So I'm going to give you, um, a, a very short period of time. And I apologize that the time span is, is not going to be very long to do this, but, um, a, you know, this is something you can take you know, these ideas, these concepts, and um, you can actually, uh, you know, share with others um, at your work or at your school or your locations too. Okay, um, I'm going to give another um, minute or less, and then we're going to go share. And I'm not sharing with every, you know, I'm, you know, I don't have time to share with everybody, but I would like to, um, but, you know, if you, if you can, um, a couple people to um, to to share um, right now. So, um, does anyone want to start? Uh, does anyone want to share? I'm happy to. Thank you, Kim. Um, I would consider myself a European mutt. Um, just too too many to name. Um, I am American. I'm a health educator. I am a mother and daughter, heterosexual, non-religious female. Okay, great. Thank you. Anyone else? I can go. Okay. Um, I'm a mother. I am a Germish, German American. I'm a Michigander, a Christian. I'm a sister, a daughter, a caregiver, nurse, teacher. Great. And your name, Marguerite, right? Marguerite. Thank you. Um, anyone else? I can do it. Yeah. Um, I am a Hispanic woman. 
I'm cisgendered, I'm partnered, I'm an educator, I'm a nurse, I'm Canadian, I volunteer, I'm a music lover, I'm also a mother and grandmother, and I'm a Methodist. Thank you, thank you, Karen. Anyone else? We'll do, we'll do maybe one or two more, and um, one or two more, Ms. Sarah? I can go. Okay. Um, I am a young woman. I am Asian American. I am an atheist. I also live in the South, so I identify a lot with Southern hospitality and those kinds of ideals. Um, I am a friend. I am a daughter, and I have um, a deep love for culture, music, movies, arts. Great. Thank you. Kani, Kanika? Kanika. 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 Thank you. Kanika. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I, I really appreciate everyone who's responded. Um, sometimes I kind of give out, you know, uh, my, you know, um, uh, information. So I'm just going to, you know, be brief. I could, I could probably go on for, for a long period of time. Um, my identify as American, but I'm also English. Um, I'm both combination. I'm also Ashkenazi Jew, and I'm also um, some kind of Anglo-Saxon, Ashkenazi Jew, and multicultural myself. Um, I grew up in multiple um, different religions, so I've kind of have multiple identities on religions, and I sort of probably um, am more agnostic in my in my belief system than um, really identifying to one religion. Um, I am a, a dad, a father, I'm a, a husband. Um, I don't have a grandchildren uh, yet. Um, I'm a cousin, I'm an uncle, um, and I love the outdoors and the environment. I love, I, I truly love, and I love um, teaching, and I love uh, teaching others and sharing information. So there's hundreds of things I could tell you more about myself, but those are a couple. So. Um, okay, um, we're going to move on and feel free to add things if you'd like. Um, we're not going to do this. I'm looking at the time, so we can't do, um, and you know, uh, more on this because we we have a sort of a limited amount of time. But what I do want to ask you all: How did it feel to define yourself? So whether you shared with the group or whether you didn't, how did it feel to define yourself? How did it feel to capture your identity in words? And feel free to do this exercise you know, afterwards, feel free to do this um, with friends or, you know, in your work setting. How many of you wrote down family roles, job roles, hobbies? What surprised you? What felt difficult about this? Was this difficult to do? And did you make any observations? Um, now look at your paper. Again, how well does it say who you are? Does that really describe you or is there more that you can put down? How many identities that you read were easily visible without having read it? How many just, you know, just got, you know, I, that was easily visible? Uh, how many were not? And then how were some of these identities culturally informed? How, how many of them were culturally informed? So we're just incorporating that culture part of it. And again, feel free to respond. Alyssa, empowering. Thank you. Intersectionality. This is a word that uh, has been around for a while, but I think we're seeing the use of intersectionality, that word, uh, a lot more. I teach, uh, I teach uh, a couple health equity courses as well. And, um, you know, some of the, the textbooks I use, intersectionality is definitely um, incorporated into uh, a, a number of the chapters that, that I teach in. So that intersectionality, the multiple social identities that intersect at the individual level, reflecting systems of privilege and oppressions at the societal level. So how does that, our social identities start to look at, you know, privilege, oppression at the societal level or things that are occurring at society? How is that intersectionality occurring? Okay, sexism, racism, heterosexism, classism, things like that. Alert, and thank you, Nicole, little challenge to try to write down all the things that describe it is. I mean, a lot of times it's overwhelming. Thank you. Thank you, Deanna. I appreciate it. Yeah, it is. I feel it is. Every time I do that, sometimes I share and sometimes I don't. So, you know, it just depends. Um, uh, you know, I think 
sometimes I want it, you know, so it just depends, depending on, on the class, but um, it is, it's, it's always overwhelming to fact, who am I, what, you know, who, what do I identify with? Intersectionality of social identities. So there are sex, race, uh, sexual orientation, um, gender identity, you know, we, I mean, these are things that we can, you know, discuss. There's so many nuances to what is ethnicity, nuances to what is race, nuances to socioeconomic status, education, linguistics, health beliefs and practices, spirituality, religious beliefs too, okay? Um, and thank you, Kim. I don't think we can completely define, uh, be defined by words, yeah. And sometimes that's where art and, uh, you know, art comes in where we use art to basically describe things. We use pictures, we use illustrations or acting or plays or those type of things to describe, you know, who we are. So it's not just writing them down. You're right, very, 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 very important. So you could even put a picture down to say, who are you? Cultural identities of those we serve shapes how they experience the world, experiences with discrimination and oppression. And I'm, I'm bringing in a little bit of this, this, this notion of privilege, oppression, because it does affect us at the societal. How does that affect us as individuals? Uh, and then how does that at the societal level, how is that affecting, you know, not only us as individuals, but how do we, you know, how does that affect when we, uh, we share with others, when we communicate, when we work with different populations, different communities, how they view and interact with you and how you view them and interact with them and provide it's that constant back and forth, that feedback um, of that, uh, those, uh, those relationships. Cultural and linguistic just a couple more throw in terms because sometimes we need to kind of define what uh, are the terms so it, I think it's important that we have terms and we define those terms so it's, it's important to, and, and the terms may differ true um, but it allows us to basically say okay that's what cultural like is competency is it's the capacity to work and communicate effectively across cultural and I think forget who it was but someone brought up called cross cultural so between cultures different cultures remember Culture can it culture is not culture is is as we've written things down it includes a lot of different uh, areas cultural humility I this is really really important and I so I'm going to provide you the, the ability to maintain a stance that's open to others in relation to aspects of your cultural identity that are most important to you this is really important it's really being open to others while you're also respecting your own culture and your own identity, while you're also, you know, valuing yourself and you're valuing others. It's really hard to do. It's amazingly difficult to do when we, when we have to, you know, we're open. We also need to make sure we're, we're valuing our own identity. And that's really, really important. So, um, what statements reflect cultural linguistic competency? So I mean, this is an open up. I want uh, individuals to share if you can. Um, uh, which statements reflect cultural linguistic competency? Does this statement, and I'm gonna read it out loud. Um, our office is culturally linguistically competent because Diana, who speaks Spanish, works with a majority of our Latino clients. Where do you think of that one? anyone you can put it in the chat box do you think this reflects no yeah yeah you know it it's not just that you speak spanish right it's more uh it's more basically it's 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 it, it involves more than just the speaking spanish involves more that i understanding uh of other cultures too and thank you i think that one um was pretty, uh, you know, pretty obvious situation. We want to adapt our services to the values and needs of the members of our community. What else can we do? What What do you think about that one? Yes, thank you, Tiffany. Yes, yeah, yeah. And uh, Aman, yeah, we want to adapt our service. So looking at previously, you know, just because you speak Spanish, but we want to make sure you're adapting to the services, adapting our services, values, and needs of the members of the community. Yep. And then we're going to go to the next one. We see our clients as the same. There's no difference between our Latinx and African-American clients' needs. Nope. Right. Good. And then the next one, 
um, is I don't like seeing those patients because they never get to appointments on time or follow the recommended treatment plan. Nope, nope, good, good. And the last one, our office is working to make sure we provide written materials in the foreign languages that are commonly spoken in our area and we offer interpretation services. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's definitely reaching out. It's adapting the services to the value and needs of the members of the community. So yes. Okay, great. I'm, it's a start. Yes, thank you, Kim. Um, cultural humility. Um, it's a continuous process of self-reflection. It's an openness to learning more about clients, prioritizing the, the client's culture perspective and acknowledging our own limitations and a continued growth and development. I do want to throw this in there uh, is that also it's making sure we, I, we are acknowledging our culture, our own culture, being aware of who we are. So that, that exercise to know who we are, who am I, is really, really important. It's a step towards, you know, achieving a cultural humility. And I, you know, um, it's hard, it's very difficult, but it's, and that's why we go back to, it's a continuous process. In what ways do you practice cultural, humil cultural humility? Okay, so I'm gonna throw this in there is I understand my cultural identity. I, I am a big, big proponent of really acknowledging what your cultural identity is. Who am I? What And what do I represent? You know, th those different cultures. So really go back to that. If you can't go back to that, um, that exercise and really look, you know, back and, and like I said, I've done that numerous times and, and every time I kind of tweak it, or I find little nuances to my own uh, cultural identity. I have a secure belief that I can explore different values without losing a sense of integrity. Yes, I like that. Um, Gina, thanks. Learn about other cultures, research, read. Yes, thanks. Open to explore others' cultural identity, and I ask questions when I'm uncertain. Questions. Now, I want to make sure we ask questions, but we don't question someone. We quest We ask questions, but not questioning what someone's background is. We ask questions to clarify what where they're coming from. I think questions are really important, but it's important also we're not questioning them. We're just trying to get clarification. I express curiosity and interest about others' beliefs and values and worldview, committed to learning and growing from interactions with individuals whose beliefs, values, and worldviews differ from mine. I always pursue for the transformation from experts when needed, or not just experts, but other individuals too. Cultural competency and cultural humility improve. This is that interaction. They improve quality of services. So when you are working, a lot of you are in the workforce, um, keep in mind that cultural competency, that interaction, the competency includes commitment to practice cultural humility. Cultural humility acknowledges that even with training and cultural competency, we have more to learn. So there's more to learn and we're, you know, and it's constantly learning and con that interaction uh, between those two. Um, I, looking at the time, I'm going to hold off on doing a small group discussion. Um, so I do want to do, put this into a group exercise. What role does cultural and linguistic competency play in your work? So I know that there were some nurses, librarians, uh, educators uh, are in there. Uh, maybe a couple of you could share in the chat box or even, um, even uh, you know, feel free to, to talk and speak. I think um, is everyone's off mute? Are we off? Are we off mute? Can we do that? Yeah. Okay. Just making sure you're allowed to, you're, you're okay to talk. So what, what role does cultural competency, linguistic um, play in your work, in your work? Well, for me, it's, I often have students that are, um, English as second language students, and some of the words don't translate well. So making sure that linguistically they understand the terminology and also addressing the cultural differences in health as I teach about it to um, my students. I like that, you know, is some of the words don't. And so that's really, really important. Very just, in, you know, a word that we may use uh, may not translate properly. I think the the Chevy Nova uh, they sold that 
uh, car in South America, there was a problem with with you know we we with the name, with the actual name on it. And that's just giving an example is, is we've got to be careful the names that we use when we're marketing with different cultures, with different uh, individuals, different languages too. So very good point. Appreciate it. Um, I'm going to the next question. What does it look like to provide services that are culturally or, and or linguistic competent? So what does it look like when we provide these services? What does it look like when we do that? What does it look like when we have interpretation services, when we value our customers' backgrounds? What does it look like? I think we, we're open and we care and we're being transparent because we don't know everything. Um, yeah. I think you. being Thank respectful um, of another culture, even when you're um, asking them to possibly change what they're doing. Um, I work in a clinic where we treat lead poisoning. There's a lot of cultural items that cause lead poisoning in children. And so having to respect that this is their culture, but helping to guide them to change it a little bit without asking them to give up what their practices are. So that that respect and kindness and under and empathy. Yeah, I like that. Um... Uh, Shireen said more engagement. Empathy is a great, you know, is a great term to use too. Empathy, uh, understanding. Uh, you work with with you know lead. I don't know if it's lead in paint or lead in water or or all of it. Um, but it's crucial to know people's backgrounds, uh, where they live, because that's a crucial. That's very very important. You know, where do you live? Um, we had the incident that occurred in Michigan. And where you know the water uh, was switched and caused uh, the the lead uh, that occurred in the, in, the, in the water system, which you know uh, where you know where and where do they live? Um, so it's important that we understand uh, their background, and that's providing those uh, services that we're competent to, to you know, asking questions to understand because we can pick up uh, in your work, but we can pick up not just well. I'm having there's there's this is going on. Where do you live? What's going on? And that's how we're able to find that that issue of the lead in the water. Um, uh, providing services in multiple languages, Inter interpreters are trained in medical interpretation, having materials reviewed by community members. I like that. Having materials, you know, involving the community, uh, participatory, uh, involving community engagement uh, is really, really important. It's challenging because of the time, but I think um, uh, it's really important. Amon says, uh, um, and using the community feedback. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I totally agree with that. Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, increasing awareness of our bias. Where are our biases? So we looked at what are our identities. We looked at that. We also have biases and we all have biases, um, you know, and it's important to try as we, uh, you know, as we more and more identify what our identities are, it's important to also know what our biases are. So when two people meet for the first time, they assess each other. Uh, what do you think about me? What do I think about them? Bias, and again, going back to a definition, is a conscious or unconscious judgment. Everyone has biases and they impact our aspects of our lives. So as we, if we identify who we are, we're all, we also are make, uh, it's important to identify our biases and biases are often based on our cultural beliefs, attitudes, opinions, we're typically not aware of. Um, another pictorial um, um, and um, picture of looking at biases, there's conscious versus sub unconscious. In the individual level, uh, we have the conscious uh, and the individual unconscious and looking at systemic, the system, there's systemic conscious and systemic unconscious. And then there's within that, there's the power and privilege. So this that intersectionality of power and privilege with our own individual identities as well. Implicit bias. Who has done this implicit bias uh, test? Who has done that? I'm trying to see. Um, Couple people who, couple people have done it. Um, what I, I'm, uh, we don't have time to do this, but I'd like everyone to uh, do this implicit bias test. And um, 
I'm wondering if I can kind of it's not copying over to the to the chat box, but um, I'll try to see if I can get it over to the chat box. But that implicit bias test, there's about 20 of them um, on this implicit.harvard.edu. And they range from uh, implicit biases on race, on ethnicity, on age, on culture, uh, on other cultural areas to on a, a number of different areas. So I think uh, if you, yeah, th thank you, Kim. I appreciate it. I, I was trying to copy it over. Uh, I don't know why it, it didn't do it this time, but thank you, please. If you haven't done it or do it again, please take that home. That's sort of homework uh, for you to do and feel free to do one, two, three, or even more. I've done quite a few of them uh, over the time. And um, I always see, you know, it really helps us to see what our biases are. So uh, I can't get uh, too involved into basically doing this exercise. Sometimes what I do is we actually have homework. We have people, uh, you do the implicit biases and we talk about it uh, during the workshop if we have an extended workshop. But what I'd like to do instead of, uh, what I like to do is basically if you haven't done it or please uh, do that uh, after this workshop is do that implicit bias test and it doesn't take long. Stereotypes. So we have bias and then we get to the stereotypes. Um, some of them, I don't do martial arts. I'm not limited in all my ways. I didn't grow up on a reservation. I'm not promiscuous. I'm not lazy. I'm not an illegal immigrant. I'm not an arranged marriage. I didn't grow up in the inner city. So again, biases can lead to what stereotypes? We're not going to do um, this exercise as a small group exercise. Um, what I'd like you to, to, to consider doing is um, to take home is, um, and this is a take home exercise, is share a story, share, share a story about one or two of the identities listed on your paper to a friend or to people at work. So what I'd like you to do is if you can, um, share a story about one or two, one of the two identities that you have. So just share it with a, with a friend, with a family member, someone at work, a colleague, just share something and use the statement, I am, but that doesn't mean this. So you could say, I am a certain uh, religion or certain faith or multiple, or I'm not, I'm, I, you know, I, could, I am an atheist, but that doesn't mean I'm this, or I'm agnostic, or that doesn't mean this, I am uh, English, but it doesn't mean I'm this. So, you know, um, it could be multiple things. So that, so I'd like you to do that too, is that take home, uh, that, uh, take that home with you as an exercise. Okay. Combating stereotypes, recognizing stereotypes commonly held about different groups can help you realize when someone is being stereotyped. So, so really, uh, recognizing them can help you realize when someone is being stereotyped. Developing empathy. I know several of you have brought up the word empathy for individuals confronting stereotypes. Avoid playing into stereotypes or saying something hurtful. And we, you know, we've heard the word microaggression. Um, sometimes it's conscious and sometimes it's non-conscious, unconscious. Um, but avoid playing into the stereotypes that can say something hurtful to another person. Stereotypes, generalizations about a group, what can they lead to? The prejudices, judgment about a group, and then what can happen? The discrimination, the negative behavior, and then oppression. So, you know, we can stop it at the, before the stereotype at the bias level, right? Before we start, before we even do stereotype, before we stereotype about a group, let's try to stop it at that bias level. But if we can't, you know, let's try to also stop it at that stereotype stereotype level. And I know most of you probably, you know, do, doing this uh, workshop probably are aware of these things. But you know, I think it's important that we we communicate this effectively to others as well. What can you do next? Work on recognizing stereotypes. Practice being aware of any judgments you automatically make about someone that are solely based on social identities of theirs. Label those judgments as stereotypes and try resisting them using one of the following techniques. Okay, techniques. 
a stereotype replacement, becoming aware of stereotypes you hold and creating non-stereotypical alternatives, counter stereotyping imaging, remembering or imagining someone from a group that doesn't fit, individuating, seeing someone as an individual, not as a group member, perspective taking, imagining the perspective of someone from a group different than your own, and contact, seeking opportunities to get to know people from stereotype groups. So those are some combating stereotype techniques. Also, uh, cultural humilities strategies, try to be other oriented, learn to think accurately about and, about and empathize with others, creating a culture of feedback, offering clients a safe space to discuss experiences really, really with my, really important to have that safe space. Uh, as, um, and then when you recognize you've committed a microaggression or you recognize you committed something, you know, maybe a bias, address it and apologize for it. Um, power and privilege looks like we are moving towards that time um, where I'm going to kind of um, move ahead a little bit further, um, a little bit quicker. So I do apologize. I'm going to kind of um, move a little bit forward, but uh, a little bit quicker. But power is a person's ability to exert influence and privilege. So we talked, I talked, I incorporated that in that intersectionality discussion, but power and privilege, power is that exerting influence and privilege is a greater support of one perspective, interests, and beliefs, along with greater access to information or resources uh, due to a membership in a dominant group. So that's that power and privilege. And, it's, uh, and remember, with dominant and non-dominant groups, our cultural identity is a combination of both dominant privileged and non-dominant marginalized groups. These are some examples. Um, I'll take age. Dominant group is young, middle-aged, and children is a non and older adults. Um, socioeconomic status, the dominant would be upper middle class, and then non-dominant would be people of lower socioeconomic status. And this is for mainly for United, we were speaking to the United States. Indigenous heritage, the dominant group in the United States would be European Americans, and then the non-dominant American Indians, Native, uh, Inuit, National Natives, Metis, Native Americans, Mayan, Taino, uh, for indigenous heritage. Um, and then ethnic uh, and racial identity would the dominant would be your Euro European Americans and non dominant Asian, South Asian, Latinx, Pacific Island, African, Arab, African American, and Middle Eastern peoples. Dominant non dominant groups. Um, again, uh, think about this as you think about what surprises you with that information. What dominant groups do you prefer? Do you? What dominant groups do you belong to? And what privileges have you experienced? Or what non-dominant groups and what privileges have you not been able to have? And then uh, and that's that next question there. And what social identities are important to you? And how does that social identities, how does that intersect with dominance and non-dominance? And I bring to back to you our, our cultural and social identities. I bring back because I really feel strongly that we bring back, who, what do I identify? What is our gender identity? What is our socioeconomic status, our geography, our abilities, our, our race or races, our age, um, our health beliefs? What are they? That, that is critical to, to basically understand ourselves, to understand what our biases are and maybe our stereotypes and things and, and to, be, to better work with others and to better uh, provide better uh, communication and better um, care for others. Uh, about a person's cultural identities, when you meet someone, what are some thoughts that cross your mind? When we saw that picture, you know, when you see something, what are you looking at that person? Are you looking at that person, uh, you know, from, how are you looking at that person from, you know, how do you see that person? We have multiple social identities that overlap. Talked about that. And the more you understand a person's social identities and how they intersect, the better you'll be able to connect with your client and form a strong relationship. Really, really important. You know, you understanding yourself and how things inter intersect. And like I said, we have multiple identities. It's that understanding, that ability to better understand ourselves helps us to connect better with clients or, or individuals who we work with or who we school or anything else, our activities. Um, people's cultural identities are important. How does the person describe themselves? 
what does the person think about others in cultural groups? How do persons' cultural identities intersect to form a unique cultural identity? And which cultural identities are they most aware of from day to day? And then which cultural identities most influence on how the world views them? So again, back to cultural identity, I'm swinging back to really being aware of your cultural identities. Um, and then here's a uh, another uh, looking at looking at when seeking to better understand clients' social identities. What are some historical events that have occurred? Some social political issues, basic values and beliefs, and cultural practices that have affected people, and how those factors affect others and affect how we uh, work, how how we see that client, and how that client, where the client's coming from. It's very difficult to get information from individuals you can't communicate with. Sometimes uh, individuals have lists of medications or the bottles of medicine. Other people may have large scars, but when you ask them what they had for surgery, they don't know. Or, may, or you may ask if they have high blood pressure and they say no, but you may find out they have medications for high blood pressure. Then they say, I don't have high blood pressure now, but I used to. Again, really, really important. How do, how do we deal with this? How do we understand this? What do we do? And in this case of Rita Quintero, Rita Quintero's found war in the streets of Johnson City in Kansas, digging through trash cans, speaking incoherently, dressing oddly, only spoke a few words of Spanish. It was diagnosed as schizophrenic at the Learn State, uh, at the Learn State Hospital um, and confined for 12 years. And a note from 1983 was found in, in Rita's chart indicating that the Mexican consulate in Salt Lake City had identified her as being from the Tara Humara Indian tribe or Native American the indigenous tribe in Mexico. She speak, uh, Rita spoke Rara Mori with limited Spanish. So again, we assume, oh, from Mexico, but limited Spanish. Um, and I, we, we only have two minutes left before we have to stop, but this is something to think of. What type of effective communication is needed in the situation? What role does cultural knowledge play? How can you get an accurate medical history from people with limited knowledge of your own health? How do we treat them? How will you incorporate lessons learned from the situation into your work? And I leave you with, um, I've got two minutes to go. Are there any questions, any questions, um, anything want to share or anything like that? I'm going to leave you with some, uh, some information here. There are some uh, cult, think cultural health, the national class standards, education programs. There are some e-learning programs online through a class. I'm gonna provide you um, some more information. This is just a summary of what we've talked about. And any, any questions? Okay, here's some, uh, looks like this is not copying over, but. I, I can provide these. I can provide this information on these references. The Office of Minority Health, Think Cultural Health, as references. Centers for Disease Control has good information on social determinants health. Um, a good textbook is Smalley, Warren, and Fernandez and Health Equity: A Solutions Focused Approach. And then U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, uh, Office of Minority Health, and Think, Think Cultural Health. And I'm trying to see if I can copy that over. If someone has uh, a chance to copy that, that'd be great. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It's uh, we're at the hour. Um, feel free to. Uh, I'm going to put my email in. It'll be my email there if you have any questions. And there we go. Um, feel free to feel free to. I think we're we're at the hour, right? Um, my IT person. It, uh, yes, we are. Okay, so I'm have to. I'm, we're gonna have to. I see, I guess we're gonna have to close it out right now. Yes, we will. Okay, so fair enough. So thank you all for attending. I really appreciate it. Um, I uh, would appreciate you know if you if you uh, you can send me an email if you have any questions. I can send you some information on some of those references. And thank you so much. And thank you for attending. And have a great day. And um, and uh, enjoy the rest of the uh, the, the conference.